Sergeants, if you can begin your recordings. Peter started. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Public Education. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for identification purposes. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Chair Ambrose Samuel. Good morning, everyone. This hearing is now. This hearing is now coming to order. The Committee on Public Housing Oversight Hearing NYCHA Waste Management Issues and Pest Problems, June 16th, 2021. We are now coming to order. Good morning, and thank you for coming to today's hearing by the Committee on Public Housing. I am Council Member Alika Ampre Samuel, and I chair the Public Housing Committee. I am joined by Council Members, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Diaz Sr., Council Member Traeger, Council Member Riley, Council Member Menchaca, Council Member Jonai, Council Member Feliz, and Council Member Cabrera. The purpose of today's hearing is to discuss waste management issues and pest problems at NYCHA's developments. NYCHA is home to over 350,000 authorized residents, every one of whom deserves to live in decent, clean, and free of fest, excuse me, decent, clean housing that is free of infestations of rats, roaches, and other pests. And that has an effective system for storing and removing trash. But for too long, many of our city's public housing residents has felt something totally different. For too long, NYCHA has struggled to get a handle on the outsized populations of rats, mice, cockroaches, and bed bugs in its developments. And we're all too familiar with the headlines and horror stories in daily newspapers about rats the size of cats, showers of maggots and cockroaches coming out of ceilings, rodents climbing up garbage chutes and out of elevators. Just this week, a constituent called our office from Park Rock Consolidation about rats that have slowly and effectively poked their way out of her floorboards in the apartment. Apart from the persistent pest infestations, NYCHA has also struggled with managing garbage storage and removal, along with mounds of trash taller than some development fences. No New Yorker would consider these conditions acceptable. And there is absolutely no reason we should consider them acceptable for our NYCHA residents. As the chair of the Committee of Public Housing, I am committed to seeing NYCHA follow through on its plans to solve these problems. Rather than simply sticking a Band-Aid on the issue, NYCHA is working and should be working to address the underlying conditions that are contributing to its waste and pest problems. On January 31st, 2019, HUD, NYCHA, and the Federal Monitor entered into an agreement to address fiscal issues at NYCHA. This included a number of action plans 
related to mold, heat, lead, and pests that were all approved by the federal monitor. I have chaired hearings on all of the topics related to these action plans. And now this is one of the last focal points of that agreement with the release of the pest and waste management plan. This final plan is comprehensive and ambitious. My hope is that today's hearing will be a productive conversation on how we can learn more about the plan and how NYCHA is working to change the way it addresses the pest and waste concerns. I'm interested to learn about the practical implementation of NYCHA's plan, how it is being funded, and how COVID-19 has affected the development and rollout of this plan. We will also hear two pieces of legislation. We have a bill from Council Member Cabrera, who was with us today, which would require 311 to directly accept NYCHA complaints and make information on those complaints public. And we also have a resolution at the request of Speaker Johnson calling on the state of New York to pass existing legislation that was introduced in the state by Assemblymember Khalil Anders Anderson and State Senator Michael Janaris that would give a prorated rent reduction to tenants who suffer interruption to their utility services. Together with my colleagues, we are seeking to not only identify the challenges, but also work with NYCHA to come up with and bring about real changes and remedies. I also wanna say that we are joined this morning by Diana Blackwell, the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board and the resident, as well as Margaret Masick, NYCHA resident, Claudia Perez from the Washington House's Resident Council. And I'm not sure if, Be if Beverly McFarlane is here from Taft Houses and Melanie Perez. And so with that, I will now turn it over to committee counsel, Audrey Sun, to go over some housekeeping rules for today's hearing. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, before I begin with the housekeeping items, would you like to hear from Councilmember Cabrera? Yes, Councilmember Council Member Cabrera. We'll hear from you now related to your bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and to the Committee on Public Housing for the opportunity to allow me to speak on the NYSHA 311 Bill 7681 today. I am often frustrated and saddened to stand at press conferences over and over again to complain about the same old problems that NYSHA neighbors have been forced to deal with for so long. Daily, NYSHA residents are forced to live in inhumane conditions because of the ne neglect and lack of transparency of this agency. It is unimaginable that NYSHA would allow tenants to live without heat in the winter months, to live with rodents and moles in the apartment as uh, today, Madam Chair, you're leading this, uh, this hearing today and, and going over this specific issue to live with broken entrance doors, which make our tenants unsafe. Elevators that at times go without repairs for months and the lack of cleanliness in the NYSHA staircases. This is why I have submitted this bill that will allow NYSHA residents to finally, finally use the, three, the city's 311 system to register complaints and make service requests since NYSHA system is dysfunctional dysfunctional and unaccountable. This bill will bring transparency and accountability today, allowing NYSHA buildings to be processed through the 311 system. Just makes sense. The 311 system works, so we should allow it to work for all. Our NYSHA neighbors are no less than others, so let us not treat them as second-class citizens. Let us, let us ex, uh, examine our 311 system the mission is to provide the public with a quick, easy access to all New York City services information while offering the best customer services. So 311 also provides insight to improve our city government through accurate and consistent measurement analysis of service delivery. And now this will be allowed through all of the complaints that will come 
through uh, our nine shot tenants. We're finally going to have a way to hold them accountable. The council will get real time uh, data through 311. Madam Chair, thank you so much for allowing me to come uh, through uh, this committee. And I want to thank uh, the staff, uh, council as well, for working on this bill. Thank you so much. And I also want to recognize that the resolution that I just referred to with the state is council member Carlos Menchaca introduced that legislation. And I just want to introduce that res resolution. I just want to um, check to see if council member Menchaca wanted to speak on this bill. I just wanted to double check. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. How you doing, Chair? Uh, really great to be here with you and everyone here on the committee and NYCHA and all the advocates. I, I just want to say that uh, we are in this council uh, supporting some state legislation that needs to get passed as soon as possible. The NYCHA Utility Accountability Act is something that really resonates with many members in my district in Red Hook who, like many of the residents across the entire city, have for years now been plagued by gas stoppages, electrical outages, laden uh, uh, drinking water that has been impacted by lead. Too often, those of us fortunate enough to represent NYCHA residents make it a big deal uh, and come to the press and talk about this openly. We bring it to the committee and we are trying our best to do the work of oversight over this agency, but it has not been enough. And so many of the residents have joined forces to really make it clear that we need uh, relief, cash relief, and that this failure uh, is not only massive in scale, has massive impact in people's homes and wallets. Uh, this cycle is beyond maddening and needs to stop. And this is why this accountability allows for compensation, compensation for these failures. This is why I'm introducing a resolution with the speaker and the chair and many other council members uh, supporting the NYCHA Utility Accountability Act. The bill would prorate rent reductions whenever utility service fails. It would uh, allow for compensation cash relief uh, at the tune of millions of dollars to our thousands of residents that are impacted every day across the year, every year. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Chair, and looking forward to the rest of the conversation today. Thank you so much, Council Member. We've also just been joined by council member Van Bramer. And I'll turn it back over to committee council. Great, thank you, Chair. My name is Audrey Sun. I'm counsel to the city council's committee on public housing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and you will be prompted to unmute. We will now hear from an opening panel of members of the public, uh, including NYCHA residents, followed by council member questions. In order to hear from everyone, the clock will be set to two minutes. First, we will hear from Diana Blackwell, followed by Beverly McFarlane. Miss Blackwell, I believe you're still muted. Miss Blackwell, you need to accept the unmute request. I'm going to send one to you now. I'm going to send it to you one more time. 
when you get the request, just accept it and unmute. No? All right, Ms. Blackwell, while we try to resolve this issue, we'll move to the next member of the public, uh, Beverly McFarlane, and then we'll return to you. Thanks so much for your patience. Yes, good morning, everyone. Good time. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me um, and I'm glad that these um, bills are up for to be passed because it's very important. Um, we are living in conditions where um, they, that NYCHA have imposed this AWS service that these buildings are not, that but have not implemented staffing. So our buildings and our garbage have not been cleaned, the rodents, are coming into people's homes and in the buildings. Um, this is a constant thing with um, sitting with NYCHA uh, management leadership, and it still is continuing happening. Uh, you know, this is preventive. This should have been preventive maintenance during the whole course of, uh, during this whole pandemic that has not been, we, there has been no cleaning of our buildings. Uh, um, you know, it's just, it's a shame that HUD is giving NYCHA all this money and have not been utilizing the money on our residents' services. And these are quality of life issues here. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they have not been doing what was utilized. We can't call 311, like you said. Um, we have to call uh, the 7108 number, the 718 ticketing is they close the ticket, open the ticket, close the ticket. And it's just been a very um, stressful for our residents. And, and, and this is a quality of life issue. So I urge y'all to pass these bills and not give NYCHA any more um, authorization in terms of, you know, is, you know, they trying to pass us off as to these resident management companies and private developers underneath blueprint for change laws, which we as resident leaders are against. So this is another opportunity for them to see that they're not good. Uh, yeah, I'll they're not good. expired. Thank you. Thank you. We will now return to Diana Blackwell, followed by Margaret Masick. Your time will begin now. Ms. Blackwell, did you receive a prompt to unmute? Okay, while we continue to work to resolve this issue, we'll move to Margaret Messick. Your time will begin now. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for this, this meeting. But what I would like to see is accountability for NYCHA, not just in the form of tenants getting paid, because we don't know if they're going to use that against us. Uh, to say we don't, they don't have enough money to do whatever, is that there's some kind of um, discipline for the NYCHA um, staff for not doing what they're supposed to do. Because from all the way, we have the monitor and people are still doing mess. This makes no sense. I don't understand why some people are not getting fired. Some people are not getting suspended for not doing their job because they cannot be above the law. If they're messing up with tenants and not keeping their promises, they need to be held accountable. And um, I appreciate all the work that the council people are doing, but I would like to please. And then also now they have, because of COVID, 
when you put in a ticket, they don't put no appointment time in and they still come. If you're still gonna come, why can't you put an appointment to say you're gonna come a certain day? Uh, because now they don't work with you with appointments. So we're almost worse than we were before because we don't know when these people are coming, especially for people that work. You can't take every day off because you, because you think they may come. So it's like, um, they need to know that there's consequences coming their way. And I would like to see a bill with that because no job should be able, above the law where they can do what they wanna do and just clock in, go home and make all that money mistreating people and not doing their job. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Uh, Diana Blackwell, we'll return to you one more time. And if it doesn't work, we'll move to testimony from the administration and then return to you. Your time will begin. Okay, at this time, we'll move into testimony from the administration. A uh, reminder to council members to please use the Zoom raise hand function if you would like to ask any questions. Uh, I will call on council members in turn in the order that they use the uh, raise hand function. Um, after we hear from NYCHA, we will hear testimony from the remaining members of the public. I will now administer the oath to the administration, which is represented by Brian Honan, Al Ferguson, Vlada Keneff, Josephine Bartlett, and Andrew Corbel. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Brian Honan? I do. Al Ferguson? I do. Vlada Keneff? I do. Josephine Bartlett? I do. And Andrew Corbel? Audrey, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew's here for support. He won't be taking questions. I'm not sure if he needs to be. Uh, I mean, it's up to the council of rules, but he won't be speaking today. He's just, he's, he's here for support. Okay, understood. Thank you. Okay. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Chair Alika Amprey Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing, other distinguished members of the city council, NYCHA residents and members of the public. Good morning. I am Al Ferguson, NYCHA's vice president of waste management and pest control. I am pleased to be joined by Vlada Keneff, vice president of energy and sustainability, Brian Honan, vice president of intergovernmental relations and Josephine Bartlett, deputy director of the pest control department. I'd like to note that I have over 32 years of experience with the New York City Department of Sanitation. I started as a sanitation worker and rose through the ranks, ultimately finishing my career as the three-star chief of citywide collection, recycling, and containerization. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the progress NYCHA is making in the critical areas of waste management and pest control ensuring that our buildings and grounds are clean and as pest-free as possible is a top priority at the authority. We know our residents are directly impacted by these issues and we are working hard to ensure that NYCHA's waste management and pest control methods are comprehensive, modern, and adaptive as the industries evolve. We have made significant changes to our approaches in these areas. We continue to implement new strategies and have long-term projects on the horizon that will further improve residents' quality of life. Over the past years, over the past few years, we have created a dedicated waste management 
department that focuses on preventing and combating pest issues, developed IT enhancements that facilitate our work, and trained staff on the integrated pest management. NYCHA is budgeted for 131 exterminators, of which we currently have 109 exterminators on staff. This includes the 22 new exterminators that we hired as part of the Neighborhood Rat Reduction Initiative. We are working on hiring additional exterminators. The New York City uh, Department of Citywide Administrative Services is in a process of certifying the new exterminator civil service list. Our pest control department is also in the process of onboarding additional exterminators by hiring residents via the NYCHA Resident Training Academy. So much. Under the leadership of Chair Russ and in accordance with the 2019 HUD agreement, we are transforming our, our, our organization to provide improved critical services to our residents and we are investing a significant amount of funding and human capital to ensure results, successful results. The Federal Monitor Bart Schwartz approved, excuse me, approved our, paste, our pest and waste management action plan in January of this year. The action plan is our map of ensuring that our practices meet our goals of more effective waste management and pest control. It is our commitment to the use of integrated pest management at the authority and the creation of development specific waste management plans for every NYCHA property. This is accomplished by targeted investments in capital upgrades and a willingness to re-envision our approaches to pest and waste management. A key, focus, a key focus of the action plan involves improving the way NYCHA collects, stores, and removes waste to meet our goal to remove or store all waste in sealed rodent resistant containers once every 24 hours. This is so important because better waste management means fewer pests as we're eliminating their habitats and sources of food. Today, I'll describe some of the waste infrastructure upgrades and programmatic improvements that will enable us to achieve our waste management and pest control goals. NYCHA's current waste infrastructure, which is responsible for managing over 200,000 tons of waste every year is outdated. Since NYCHA's developments were built, the amount of waste generated by Americans has tripled. At the same time, NYCHA's infrastructure hasn't received the investments it's needed to keep up with that increase. In fact, more than 80% of our waste assets are past their life cycle and need immediate replacement. The Federal Monitor approved NYCHA's City Capital Action Plan last month, which unlocks over $563 million in funding to help the authority fully upgrade and modernize its waste infrastructure. Nearly $9 million uh, in state, city, and federal funds will be added to the City Capital Action Plan. A total investment of $47 million toward Mayor de Blasio's Neighborhood Rat Reduction Program has enabled us to accomplish the following. Install larger trash chutes that, that can accommodate a standard 13 gallon tall kitchen garbage bag on the first level of 50 developments, which, which helps residents dispose of trash properly. Next, install new interior trash compactors at 38 developments, exterior compactors at 16 developments, and 10 bulk crushers and 20 cardboard compacting bailing machines, all of which enable us to manage waste more effectively and efficiently. Next, we installed over 5,000 of uh, 8,000 door sweeps that prevent pests from getting into our buildings and install 14 out of 50 rat slabs that eliminate places for rodents to live eat and breed by replacing the original dirt basement floors with concrete. With this total funding of more than $619 million, we'll be able to replace aging waste, recycling and bulk waste equipment at 324 sites across 197 developments. 
Better waste management means fewer pests and fewer pests leads, uh, lead to an increase in the overall quality of life for our residents. In conjunction with the increased funding for infrastructure, we are making programmatic and design improvements. For instance, at the beginning of the pandemic, we, institute, we instituted a clean to the ground initiative to keep waste yards, trash and litter free, an especially challenging task considering that stay at home mandates resulted in a significant increase in the amount of household waste that was generated at our developments. We worked with our close agency partner, the New York City Department of Sanitation, to obtain a sizable increase in the number of DSNY funded bulk container dump tickets. This increase represents the removal of nearly 12,000 additional tons of bulk waste from NYCHA developments last year. We work with the carting vendors who currently service most of our bulk containers to ensure that they increase capacity so that they, can, they could increase the frequency of bulk waste removal at our developments. To demonstrate the benefits of increased waste collection frequency at a small group of developments, we purchased two six yard rear loader compacting garbage trucks that can each hold approximately three tons of household refuse per load. These trucks are equipped with the latest Envision Zero safety divine, designs, including 360 degree cameras for enhanced drive awareness and have the latest in hybrid, uh, that's both diesel and electric technology. NYCHA has also worked with our sanitation department partners to develop a recycling reset pilot program to improve recycling rates at 12 sites. Baruch, Baruch Edition, Bushwick, Highland, Butler, Marcy, Morris 1 and 2, Reese 1 and 2, Webster, and Morrisania. The results are tangible and sustainable. Several sites, such as Baruch and Reese Houses, are recycling at record high rates. When the pilot began in early 2020, Baruch Houses reported six bags of recyclable material for their weekly pickup. In November 2020, they reported 253 bags of recyclables. Mm -hmm. Reese Houses recorded 384 bags during that same period. The Waste Management Department is finalizing the individual waste management action plans for each of our developments. We have gathered development specific data via both virtual and in-person site visits over the past year. By cataloging and mapping our current at waste assets and reviewing various critical aspects of waste management operations and development specific challenges with NYCHA staff, we effectively created short, medium and long-term action plans to improve waste management at each site. Some of the solutions include providing additional bulk tickets each month, as well as shepherding the procurement process for faster compactor replacement. We are also finalizing a newly created uh, scorecard cleanliness rating system with the assistance of the federal monitor. This will provide an objective rating regarding the cleanliness of critical areas in both the interior and exterior of all of our developments and will allow us to highlight areas that need attention and help redirect resources on a development level. In 2019, the authority released the NYCHA 2.0 Waste Management Plan, a comprehensive set of strategies for delivering state-of-the-art infrastructure and providing residents with convenient locations for disposing recyclables and food waste, all to greatly reduce pests and make our developments cleaner. To advance the waste management plan, this year we released requests for proposals for the redesign of seven waste yards and for, the, for a new pneumatic waste collection system at Polo Ground Towers, all to start construction in 2022. By 2028, we will have a completely overhauled Sorry. By 2028, we will have 
completely overhauled the waste yards at 194 developments. These redesigns will replace aging, wi aging waste infrastructure with the new yards that will have an increased footprint, have more operational functionality, increase additional much needed recycling infrastructure, and have more reliable compactors, making waste handling more efficient, thereby improving the quality of life of our residents. The new waste yards will be more aesthetically pleasing than past designs and will incorporate past resident feedback. The pneumatic waste collection system at Polo Grounds will transport waste from each building underground to a centralized facility where it will be compacted in a sealed pest resistant container. This new system will reduce the amount of labor used to transport waste and will minimize exposure to pests. This summer, we are launching a mattress recycling program at 25 developments to containerize, remove, and recycle unsightly mattresses while providing job opportunities for NYCHA residents. It will ultimately be scaled up to 100 or so developments. Over the past year, we piloted two dedicated exterior cardboard compactors at Marcy and Morris One Houses. This resulted in recycling of more than 116 tons of cardboard. We are evaluating the use of in-sync food disposers at select sites to reduce organic waste from household waste streams, eliminate food waste, food sources for pests, and divert organic materials from landfills. Our farms at NYCHA sites are also helping to achieve these goals. Since 2016, our lead partner, Green City Force, has collected over 21,000 pounds or 10 and a half tons of uh, compostable food scraps from NYCHA residents. One Green City Force alum and former NYCHA resident, Domingo Morales, is working to expand composting at NYCHA developments through an initiative he started called Compost Power. In 2020, Compost Power organized composting at five NYCHA developments that can now process at least 50 tons of organic waste per year. Compost Power provides NYCHA residents with the opportunity to reduce waste from landfills while creating more eco-friendly jobs. Our waste management efforts are being carried out in partnership through outreach and education programs led by NYCHA, residents, and other stakeholders. For example, NYCHA is developing a campaign for a clean NYCHA to better communicate with and engage residents on proper waste management and recycling programs. The campaign is rolling out at five developments this summer. It will apply the tools of public awareness and behavior change to define and promote a positive waste culture at NYCHA. It will feature highly visible signage and other visual prompts developed in close collaboration with and input from residents, community-based organizations and other advocates. Mayor de Blasio City Cleanup Corps initiative has granted us $7 million in funding to hire 1,000 seasonal workers who will keep our grounds, playgrounds, and buildings clean and well-maintained. This will include waste handling and assisting with our pest control work. An integral cornerstone of our new approach to pest control was the agency-wide rollout of the industry gold standard, integrated pest management. IPM focuses on sustainable and long-term solutions that target the underlying causes of pest infestations. Exterminators perform a thorough inspection, looking for and removing sources of food and water, as well as any points of entry. They perform exclusion work such as caulking and installation of escutcheon plates while minimizing the use of pesticides. We incorporated IPM protocols into our IT systems and issue updated standard procedures and guidance regarding IPM to staff. We have trained over 700 staff 
caretakers, supervisors, and other property management staff on the fundamentals of IPM. And we kicked off quarterly trainings on specific IPM topics. Resident education is an essential element of pest prevention. Educational materials have been created to inform residents about IPM best practices for prevention, including handouts, rent inserts, and a comprehensive NYCHA pest control webpage. <clears throat> we have provided targeted relief to more than 6,200 apartments with recurring pest problems. The targeted relief program also involves inspecting and treating the adjacent apartments above, below, to the left and the right of the apartments that had the identified recurring pest problem. While we know that more work needs to be done, it is clear that we are making progress. Reducing pests and creating cleaner and cleaner communities is truly a collaborative effort. And by working together, NYCHA employees, residents, community organizations, city agency partners, we can continue to bring our vision to fruition. We will keep advocating for the funding we desperately need for critical capital investments and we will continue to engage our residents to make sure that their needs and priorities are incorporated into the work we're doing to improve pest and waste management practices. Thank you. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Um, and welcome aboard. And I, I, I have you. to say that I am um, pleased to hear that you have such an extensive background <sighs> and experience in work in history, previous work in history at the Department of Sanitation. And um, it seems as though just from your testimony that you have a lot of work ahead, but you've been implementing a lot of work um, utilizing your expertise and experiences. So I do appreciate that. Um, so let's just get right into it with, I represent 27 NYCHA developments just within my own council district. And my constituent services, constituent complaints clearly um, have a lot to do with pest control and waste management. Um, but as we focus on our health and as we focus on our environment and sustainability and just seeing what happened during 2020 with the pandemic, we have to make sure that we are being strategic in the work that we're doing, um, providing information to the residents and really being um, focused on health and safety and it just uh, an overall clean environment. Um, and so with that, I want to just begin with a lot of background questions. How many pest complaints did NYCHA have in 2019, 2020, and right now in 2021 for each pest type? And that is rats, mice, cockroaches, and bed bugs. Thank you, Chair, for that question. Uh, I'm going to re refer you to my Deputy Director of Pest Control, uh, Josephine Bartlett. Thank you, Chair, for that question. So in 2019, there were 3,434 verified rat complaints and 85,341 mice, bed bugs, and uh, roaches in 2020. It was 4,741 um, verified rats and 46,492 of the other three public health pest types. And so far this year, we have 1,204 verified rat complaints and um, 15,600 so far this year in the other three pest types. And right now to date, are you able to tell us how many open complaints, like how many um, complaints that are open right now that you're actively working on? 
to for today? So as of yesterday, when I pulled the numbers, we have 4,417 extermination work orders open. And this is corrective maintenance work orders. So these are the work orders that come in through the CCC um, and that we will have created our own. It's not preventative maintenance work orders that we also do. Okay, and can you explain the difference between so going back to the, the, my first question, how many pest complaints did NYCHA have? I said 2019, 2020, 2021. And then you gave me a number for 2021. So can you explain the difference between the pest complaints for 2021? What number was that? So we've got 1,204 verified complaints uh, in rats and 15,600 in the other three pest types so far this year. Okay, so the 4,417 extermination correction um, work orders that you're working on, can you explain what that number is out of the 15,000? I'm just trying to get some clarity. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have inspection work orders, corrective maintenance work orders, and preventative maintenance work orders. The corrective maintenance work orders are what is called in through the CCC, but it's also what um, our staff, when they're on the grounds, if they see a um, rat row that they need to um, address right then, they'll make a corrective maintenance work order and um, treat that right then. So that might have been, that was captured when I ran the numbers yesterday. Um, preventative maintenance worker orders at the beginning of each month, we have um, a PM work order that's created for every single building and the exterminator goes and does a check of the basement and the uh, rounds. And this is part of our new philosophy of integrated pest management, really inspecting, getting to the root cause, not trying to get ahead of um, infestations, not just waiting for um, it to be told to us. Um, and then there's also inspection work orders that are mostly tied to um, special initiatives that you heard with the HUD deliverables, the targeted relief program, um, clean building initiative, um, such of that nature. Okay, how, how much garbage did NYCHA collect in tons in 2019, 2020, and in 2021? Thank you for that question. Uh, in, uh, we do not have that information. Uh, that information is uh, maintained by the New York City Department of Sanitation. Uh, and that I, I would like, I'd refer you to them for that answer. Okay, so I'm not going to refer to them. I would like to get that number, um, especially okay. since you was there for 50 years and then now you're <laughs> over at night. <NYCHA. laughs> okay. And so, and I say that, you know, just seriously. Um, yes. When I, so when I set this stage about where we are today, I just want to make sure that we're not just having a conversation, but that we're really, we're able to receive information so that we can figure out um, how we move forward so that, you know, everyone is working together, right? Yes. And, I, and I really think that that's why, I could only imagine that that's why you're in the position that you're in um, right. at NYCHA is because of your, you, you, you know, your um, experiences and your relationships at sanitation. Um, yes. And it would just be helpful to just kind of have that information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that I, I will, I'll make the appropriate contacts to get uh, as much information as we can. But I just want to let you know that, you know, we should be able to, you know, sanitation should be able to get uh, containerized information because that's recorded at the dumps. Uh, we should be able to get bulk information from them because that's also recorded at the dumps. Uh, but the only uh, information that we probably cannot get is for curbside collection material, which represents about half of our developments, uh, because that material is commingled with uh, the other residential garbage 
uh, of the neighborhood surrounding the developments. It's all on the same route. When they pick up NYCHA, they pick up all the, the different uh, buildings in the neighborhood as well. So they wouldn't be able to pinpoint the tonnage. You know, they can only make guesses or estimates probably on that. But we'll, okay. we'll continue that conversation. I'll set okay. that up. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to it. Okay, cool. And just so you know, whenever there's, there's a, a issue with sanitation or a question, <laughs> you know, we're going to look at you like, uh, you should know. Call somebody. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Um, what is the common pest complaint that NYCHA receives? The most common. Thank you for your question, Chair. Uh, I'm going to refer you to Josephine Bartlett. Hi, Chair. Thank you for that question. It's roaches. Okay. Okay. And what is the what is there a common complaint even? And I hate to even dive into this part of it, right? We like really get into the weeds, but just to understand it, um, what is the common complaint even within the the roaches themselves? Because I know that there can be roach infestation where there's roaches everywhere. And then it can also be where, um, you know, you're removing the cabinets, uh, which is something that, you know, they did a story with Cephalo in my development. There are, you know, roaches in the cabinets. And when you remove them, they're just everywhere. Is it when there's, you know, a renovation happening, you know, maintenance work? Can you just... So mostly it's low level roaches that we um, see, um, you know, the resident sees them underneath the sink and in the cabinets. But what I can tell you as part of the integrated pest management, this new approach about getting to the root causes and sealing up cracks and holes that these roaches are coming through is that updated um, work that exterminators now have to do is caulking in the cabinets. So like sealing around all the little cracks in a cabinet so they're not like getting through. We're also looking for holes um, around pipes um, and stuffing them with uh, steel wool mesh um, so that they can't get through there. Uh, we're using the HEPA vacuum, which um, we can vacuum up their, uh, we call it fraz, it's the roach poop and wings and skins and things like that. And it is a way that we can get rid of that, which keeps the roaches coming back. Um, and so we get rid of that and then we use gel um, exactly where we see it. So more targeted. Okay, okay. How long does it take NYCHA to resolve a roach infestation, bed bug infestation, rat infestation or mice infestation? So can you now just go over like the timing, your, your timeline or of how you sure. resolve these issues once someone calls it in? or if they don't call it in? Absolutely, so I'll just keep going with this question. Um, for, um, by the time the, the work order is created till the first time our exterminator goes for rats, it's an average of 3.3 days as of last month. And um, all the other three pest types, it's an average of 4.47 days as of last month. That is not um, like the completion of the work order when it's um, a more complicated work order where we're doing um, leaks, cabinet repair, all of that. It jumps up to bed bugs is often 36 days because we have to do follow-ups. It's not just one treatment, unfortunately. Um, 24 days for mice, 15 for rats, um, 44 for roaches. That's when, and this comes into play, um, court cases, mold cases. I heard the number 24. What you were referring to, what again? I wasn't that sure. That is hour, 24 days. Days. It is days. That is not for, to our first look at the situation, though. For uh, mice, which is the 24 days, um, it is 4.47 days. So from when that first call is made till when our exterminator gets in. Has NYCHA implemented its planned enhanced routing for pest related work orders? Thank you for that question. Uh, 
Chair, uh, I'm going to refer you again to Josie Bartlett. Thank you, Chair. Can you clarify on the enhanced routing? Um, so I was actually under the impression that there was a new plan strategy for when you receive a complaint and just the timeline coming in from the action plan itself. And, um, and, and that's why I wanted the clarity with mm. the 24 days, because I remember reading something um, that mentioned, um, like if there's a, 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 um, a rat infestation, it would be a 24 hour response and, um, you know, you would yeah. go in and address the issue within 24 hours. And so just what you mentioned that the timeline just seemed a little different from what I was, what I actually read. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we get into jargon and we call it our priority matrix. And this is part of our new standard procedure that we just created. And you're absolutely right. Um, rats in the interior apartments are priority seven that we must respond within seven days. Um, and um, as of this month, we are um, hitting that deliverable most of the time. Why you saw a different number than what I say, because there's um, rats on the grounds too. Um, rats on the grounds have a priority level four, which is um, within seven days, but we are doing rats as of last month um, within 3.3 days. Um, so we are hitting our deliverable. Um, for that, but um, the priority matrix, that's what, so it's um, priority seven within 24 hours um, for interior and priority four within seven days on the exterior for rats. So when someone, let's just as an example, um, received a call on Monday from a resident who had um, rats coming into, she had one rat that she saw in her apartment and um, she called it in, she called us. So what would be the process of someone coming in? So she makes the call. I have a rat that came into, I just saw a rat in my kitchen. What happens then? Like the priority, just explain just a, a snapshot of the process of getting rid of that rat in that building and that apartment and just the timeline of it. Yeah, absolutely. So rat inside of the apartment, when we get that, we, our goal and what we're hitting is within 24 hours. So we would get it from the CCC. They tell them right then we'll be there. Um, if we have someone assigned to that development right then, they um, part of our new standard procedure is even if they have other work orders uh, assigned to them, which they will, uh, with a rat inside with a siding, um, they, they stop their usually scheduled work. They call their supervisor. They say, you know, there's a rat inside an apartment. This is an emergency. So we go to that work order right then. If it's uh, after hours, our um, emergency services team is involved. Okay. Okay, and so if it's not a rat, let's say they see um, on a sticky pad, they've captured on a sticky three mice. What would, and they call and they say, you know, I have um, mice in my apartment. What happens with, the, with that? Mice within an apartment is, um, we're doing um, within the initial, an average of 4.47 days. That's our response time for mice. So the, the, we would get the CCC call, um, the planning unit would get the um, work order ticket. They would um, reach out to the resident if we have the phone number on um, in our records or, um, and if we can get a hold of them, regardless, we schedule it and the letter goes to the management office. That letter goes under their door um, from caretaker staff saying we're coming at such and such date. Um, we get in hopefully on that date. Um, if the tenant is not home on the day that we are there, um, we go a second time on a different day. Okay, what types of pesticides does NYCHA use at the developments? I 
thank you for your question, Chair. I'm going to defer you again to uh, Josie Bartlett. Okay, and, and while I'm asking that question, does the pesticides have any side effects? Um, does NYCHA provide any warning when they treat an area with the pesticides? And, um, and, can you, and does NYCHA determine which infestation complaints warrant the use of you know, particular pesticides? So can you just kind of take us through the steps of the use of the sure. pesticides, what they are, side effects, things of that nature? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, all of the pesticides that we use are on our new pest control um, website. Um, we're using things like Max Force and Vendetta Gel for strikes off bait, which is um, for rats, final pellets for direct burrow baiting, um, Sterifab for bed bugs. I mean, pesticides are a chemical, so yes, but what we do do is there is Department of Environmental and Conservation uh, regulations, which we um, follow. Um, the exterminators like to say the label and not to say, but this is how it goes. Um, the label is the law. You have to follow what the label says when you're um, treating. It gives you exactly the amount that is appropriate. So um, like first strike on the grounds, you can put um, in the bait stations, um, 15 to 30 feet. Um, you're not, you can't do it less than that. So we follow um, the DEC regulations. And I can say as part of our new approach of integrated pest management, which is all about being more environmental and healthier for residents that we really only, we use when it is needed. So that's why we're using the HEPA vacuum at roaches. So we, stops the roaches from coming back. And then we use gel in the specific areas where um, we see the infestation. We're really reducing the amount of spray that we use for roaches, which as I said, was our biggest pest type. Um, spray, you know, goes elsewhere. Gel really sits where the infestation is. So that's how we're minimizing where the pesticides go. We also have um, a burrow collapsing team that works at our highest um, rat infestation development. And their job is to go around and collapse rat burrows. And this is a non-toxic way of getting rid of rats. So it collapses their home. They have to spend their time rebuilding their home instead of um, mating. So this reduces um, the amount of rats. It also lets our exterminators know which burrows are active and which are not active. So we don't have to use pesticides in um, the rat burrows that are inactive. So we're using less pesticides overall. And you're tracking that? Like, how are you tracking that? How are you tracking pesticides versus, you know, other um, technology or strategies to make that determination, you know, as to this is not effective and we need to now do a pesticide. How are you tracking that? Yes, so every work order um, that an exterminator has shows exactly how much um, pesticides they use, what type of pesticide and um, what component of the apartment that they put it on. So did they put it in the cabinet? Did they put it on a baseboard on um, the exterior? Did they do uh, like, bait along the foundation so we can track how much, what it was and um, where it was. And we're also tracking, um, and this is a new thing that we did within the last uh, year and a half as part of integrated pest management, also on those work tickets, we track um, what other um, work we're doing. Um, are we sealing up holes? Are we caulking around cabinets? Are we using the HEPA vacuum? Did um, the resident receive our um, best tips about how to keep your home pest free flyer that we're giving to every resident when the exterminator comes into your house? Because uh, really integrated pest management is us working together. It's sometimes as simple as, you know, putting your dog food um, bowl away overnight. Um, so it's things like that you don't really think about, but helps out our extermination team a lot. Okay. 
I just have um, one more question for now because I know that we have some very long days um, in the council and my colleague, Councilmember Ayala has her hand raised. Um, so I'll stop after this question and go to Councilmember Ayala. Are NYCHA RAT complaints recorded with DOHMH RAT information portal? Thank you for your question, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm going to refer you to Josephine Bartlett. Oh, Josephine. <laughs> so you can take a water break, Josephine. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we do work with our Department of Health partners there um, for neighborhood rat reduction developments, which is 104 uh, developments. They um, count the rat burrows monthly. It wasn't monthly during the pandemic because their um, inspectors were pulled in other directions, but for the most part, we get monthly counts and that we have um, access to that map in real time. And we're currently working with our um, monitor, the federal monitor, to um, release our numbers on a quarterly basis um, publicly. So that will be coming. OK. OK. Oh, I'm going to stop there and then go Great. back to my question. Thank you. We'll now turn it over to other council members to ask any questions. Again, in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members, we please ask that you keep your questions to five minutes in the interest of time. Uh, Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. Um, first, we'll begin with council member Ayala. And again, a reminder to other members, if you'd like to ask a question to please use the Zoom raise hand function. Is it possible for you to come back around to me because I'm on uh, on land use as well and I'm expected to vote in a second? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> sure, lots of uh, lots of multitaskers on the council. Um, <laughs> um, are there any count other council members at this time who have questions? Otherwise, Chair, we can continue with with your questions. It looks like no other members have their hand raised. Hands, ah, okay. We have a hand from Council Member Riley. Good morning, good morning. I'm also on land use right now, but I do want to ask a very quick question. Uh, I'm sorry if it's garbage each night you development. Is it weekly? Is it monthly? How frequently is garbage picked up? Garbage is picked up uh, between uh, two and four times a week, you know, depending on the neighborhood. The low and medium density areas are picked up twice a week, and the high density areas are picked up uh, three times a week. Recycling at those locations are picked up once a week. Thank you, Vice President Ferguson. Um, and just a request, because um, I was walking through um, Eaton Wall Houses, which I believe is the second largest nitro development in the city. Um, and there was an abundance of garbage um, in front of a lot of the buildings. And what we do see is uh, when people usually see abundance of garbage, they usually put more garbage there. And I did hear a lot of the uh, amazing plans uh, that NYCHA is doing now. And just hope we can kind of work together to come because um, we really want the individuals that live in the NYCHA development to treat like a community. But when it looks like garbage and garbage is just overflowing, thank you, NYCHA, for your hard work. Hopefully we can work together. In the okay. Is um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. And, and um, Council Member, we'll make sure that we have folks look at it will both on the bulk side um yeah. and the uh, regular trash too um as well um and we'd uh we don't also you know now as the summer um is here um we would you know look uh to use the time uh that things slow down a little bit if that's everything but we could walk the grounds with you too and you could point some of these issues out with you uh love to do that as well
Thank you, Brian. I really, really appreciate that. We we always had a great relationship working together, so I really would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, that's that's it. I, I'll yield my time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Riley. Oh, Audrey, that's that's it. Yeah, I think that's it for Councilmember questions at this time. Okay. Moving along um, to the Pest and Waste Management Plan. How has COVID-19 impacted NYCHA's ability to comply with the goals set in the pest and waste management plan? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that question. Uh, I'll handle the waste side uh, first, uh, and then I'll hand over the pest side to uh, Josie Bartlett again. Um, so as far as the waste, uh, the waste management plans, uh, we uh, we were able to accomplish a lot uh, with you know during the pandemic. Uh, we initiated a clean to the ground initiative, where uh, we actually uh, we instructed developments to uh, make sure that all the grounds and the waste yards were absolutely clear of material. For my sanitation experience. I know that, uh, and, and very much like Council Member Riley indicated at Edenwald, garbage begets garbage. That you know you need to have an absolutely clean facility, uh, clean development. Uh, it's not only a quality of life issue, but uh, you know it it it, it causes uh, other types of problems as well. So uh, we were able to during the pandemic, we were able to. Uh, better enhance uh, you know some of our waste related infrastructure you know making upgrades installing in sync in sync foods uh food waste disposers uh cardboard balers bulk crushers uh enlarging the ground floor trash chute uh i'm not sure if you're familiar with the you know the trash chutes in the buildings are uh you know are relatively small on each of the floors and uh one of our uh big initiatives i think that will help out tremendously is by putting the uh, enlarged hopper door on the ground floor. So, uh, because most people have the, they use the tall kitchen garbage bag, which is about a 13 gallon bag. And that will fit in these uh, enlarged trash doors in the lobbies. Uh, we also were able to create and hire staff for the waste management department. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, about the the bulk tickets that were able additional bulk tickets were able to get from sanitation. Uh, we uh, actually, when I started, uh, sanitation was giving NYCHA 800 bulk tickets per month, and that number has grown to 1250. And uh, even in some months that they, we were actually requested more, I think our, our peak number was uh, 1,450 uh, bulk loads removed from our developments in one month. So uh, we know we've been able to get rid of a, a lot of material. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the bottom line with waste management is you have to get rid of it as soon as it's created. And, uh, you know, because it's just going to uh, create a host of problems that could be eliminated. Um, and now I'll give you uh, Josie Bartlett for the pest control side. Just for um, sure. educational purposes, um, can you just explain bulk tickets? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I apologize that it was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that bulk tickets are tickets that are given to the housing authority from the New York City Department of Sanitation, where we use our private, our private vendors to uh, pull the boxes of the 30 yard containers, you know, the big containers of bulk, uh, but sanitation pays for the uh, disposal of that. So sanitation originally was giving us 800 and we are, uh, you know, we're upwards of 1,250. That is the new quota that they're giving us every month. And I would say in the last couple months during tax season and uh, with the stimulus money, there has been a lot of extra bulk uh, at the developments. 
So uh, basically, these developments have grown from 1250 number, you know, for the month. And it's, uh, I've requested an additional 200 tickets, which sanitation, by the way, has been a super, super agency partner uh, in accommodating and being very responsive, quick turnaround. I don't think I made the request uh, at, at 1.30 in the afternoon, and I had a response by like 1.37. And they, they immediately said, come pick it up tomorrow morning, and we got an additional 200 tickets. And what does that mean to us? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, that each bulk container holds about 2.2 tons of material. You know, that's the average amount of bulk that's in there. Uh, and again, all of this material, uh, you know, we, we find it on all my many visits at NYCHA properties that uh, people get new furniture or new things and then they're, they're not always sure where to put it. So they just put it outside. They put it in the front. They put it in the back. They put it over near the waste disposal, you know, where we have our waste yards. So, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of education to do. And that's also part of the action plan going forward uh, that uh, we need to create a better process, a better system at our developments. Did I answer your question on the bulk tickets? Was that clear? Yes, that was clear. You know, sometimes okay. when you hear tickets, you you might think, um, you know, like something negative, like you receive the ticket and have to pay for. Yes. Something that uh, so I just wanted just clarification around that. Yes, it's actually, it, it seems a little, the system seems a little primitive at the, because it's actual a physical ticket that they give us for the dumping of the load. But that's, it just happens to be, that's that's the way it is right now. And uh, we, we, we it, it has a control number on it. And, uh, you know, they have to dump the load within three hours uh, from leaving the development uh, to go into the actual dump itself. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of red tape in there. But uh, I, I will tell you, bar none, that since, uh, since I've been communicating with sanitation, that they've been nothing but responsive. And any development that has requested additional bulk tickets, I have granted them. Because they, they definitely need it. <laughs> That's good to know. So it's, so it's excellent to know that there's been the, you know, like a, a, a double of the tickets that, that are being issued and it is very helpful. <laughs> but the, the, the crazy part is, is an actual physical ticket, right? That's, that's just so crazy to me. Like, yes. I think that in this age of technology, we would have, you know. I am trying to work with sanitation because that that is uh, that is a I, I'm not sure if it's like a DOI issue uh, mm -hmm. that but it was something that was created a, a, quite a while ago cool. and yeah <laughs> clearly uh, <clears throat> and it's just something that we actually even have to get when they they take the actual ticket and they stamp it at the development as well yeah. it's stamped with the development name and a, a time punch to start the clock for the three hour window that they're allowed to dump the load. And, you know, that's, it, you know, and in, in some cases it was a logistical nightmare to have somebody come in and, you know, the machine wasn't working to do the punch and things like that. So I'm definitely, uh, you know, I'm definitely looking to change that. I am a fully automated person. I, I like everything. And that was one of my signatures at sanitation was to automate everything because I am not into pencil and paper because automation leads to better accountability all across the board. Thank you for that. I know Brian is kind of squirming in his chair right now, Brian Holt, because he's like, oh my goodness. Because <laughs> that would be like a whole other uh, our questions related to reminds me of boiler rooms and, and signing in. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a, getting flashbacks. Let's just, do it that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. yeah. gonna move this along. Um, I can so, jump in about some of the uh, pest um, things that we have done as part of the um, HUD deliverables. So. On the pest side, we uh, implemented the prioritization matrix. That's what we spoke about earlier with the different priorities based on best uh, pest types. 
We've created a flag for units with self-reported health conditions. So um, we know if a resident is pest sensitive, if they've let us know, and then we respond to that pest complaint um, quicker than otherwise. We've created a new standard procedure all around integrated pest management. So it updates the roles and responsibilities of staff members and what they now have to do. Exterminators aren't just treating, they're doing the caulking, the HEPA vacuum, the whole ceiling. Um, we have did the targeted relief initiative. This is part of the HUD agreement where um, there was a certain time frame and um, any apartment that had um, one or, or two or more um, pest infestations, we went in, we did full integrated pest management. And we also, if there was an infestation, we did the adjacent unit. So up, down, side to side. Um, okay, I just wanted to remind you of the, the question itself. So I was asking, has COVID-19 impacted NYCHA's ability to comply with the goals that were set in the plan? Um, okay. And so I just wanted to, you know, get a sense of, of like, the impact of COVID-19. Absolutely. Yeah. So we were able to do a lot of things that um, weren't in unit work, but things such as the targeted leaf program took us longer because we weren't able to get into apartments, but we did finish it at the end of last year. And um, the NYCHA pest infestation indexing, which is another HUD deliverable that requires us to get into apartments, that was um, a shorter program than we would have otherwise done um, if it wasn't COVID. But we were able to do a lot of IT fixes and standard procedures and trainings um, instead. Do you have like a percentage or any kind of numbers at all related to um, the number of apartments that you may not have been able to enter because of COVID or, you know, um, and my next question is, um, are you experiencing the backlog of work orders due to staffing and maintenance adjustments in response to COVID-19? So during COVID, um, there was a backlog of work orders that built over those months um, to 7,694. Um, but as soon as we could start getting back into the apartments, we worked on a plan to hit that backlog and we've got into those tickets now. Um, however, now also people were not calling in as the same rate during the like heavy COVID-19 because they didn't want people inside their apartment naturally. So now we're seeing people call and as I uh, testified earlier, we currently have the little over 4,000 work orders right now um, that we are getting to. How much funding has been allocated to NYCHA to address the goals set forth in the pest and waste management plan? Um, and can you disaggregate between the expense and the capital spending? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am going to refer you to Vlada Kenneff, Vice President of Energy and Sustainability. Thank you, Chair, for that question. I'm going to focus on the capital side of your question. Um, as we've discussed yesterday, I came to NYCHA to focus on waste management and we wrote the comprehensive waste management plan specifically to advocate for recapitalization of NYCHA's waste management assets. Um, we recognize that many of the waste management assets, uh, both compaction and containerization, the interior compactors, the exterior compactors, many of them are at the end of their useful lives. And we've been successfully able to advocate for $563 million for uh, capital investment in uh, NYCHA's infrastructure. 
through the city capital action plan, we are very proud and very uh, happy to start working on this. Procurements are in motion for uh, a lot of this work already. Uh, NYCHA has been focused uh, on the uh, neighborhood rat reduction work up until now. Uh, that's been uh, a approximately $47 million, both in city and federal funding. Um, and there's another $9 million that's uh, invested in capital infrastructure outside of the na uh, neighborhood rat reduction areas. Did I answer your question? And I think the expense side of the, uh, the question, Al, uh, we may have to get back to you on that. Okay, I'm gonna just read, just in case I missed something, I'm actually just gonna read the question so that you can answer it and be able just, now this is for the record so that um, we can just have like just a clear question and clear answer. What is the total amount NYCHA has committed to pest and waste management to date? And can you disaggregate the, this by project type? Uh, to date, we have $619 million in total committed in capital funds. Um, I described the $563 million as a part of the city capital action plan, and that could be broken down further in the city action plan uh, by project type. And uh, the $47 million of neighborhood rat reduction funding, uh, that is another pot of funding that's been focused on things like hoppa doors, interior compactors, exterior compactors, some bulk crushers, some rat slabs. Um, and we can give you those precise numbers separately. And there's another $9 million that is uh, outside of the uh, neighborhood rat reduction work that we can also disaggregate. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop there because I see that council member Ayala is back and I wanna make sure that she's able to jump in because she may have to leave again. Thank you. I actually have a few questions, but ironically enough, while I was waiting, somebody just texted me uh, uh, from Morris Avenue, 414, if somebody can deal with an issue over there, apparently the door broke and now the residents cannot access the building. They can't come in and out because it's locked. Okay. Uh, so would appreciate it if somebody could look into that. Um, I'll get on that, Councilman. Thank you. Um, I, I, you know, I have a, I, I have to bring this up and I, you know, and I apologize because I'm one of those uh, people very much so that, you know, I don't like to shoot the messenger um, because I understand there's a lot of complexity that happens, you know, NYCHA is a, it's, it's a huge agency and there's a lot that's happening and, you know, we could be here for days talking about this. However, I will, and I have been bringing it up and I will continue to bring it up at every single hearing until it has been rectified because my buildings are horribly, horribly, I mean, uh, dirty, beyond dirty, they're filthy. And, you know, we have been meeting and having conversations about this for some time. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why, and I get, you know, um, that there has to be some responsibility also on the end of, you know, uh, residents, right? Residents shouldn't be throwing garbage out of the window, but then what is NYCHA doing to address that? Um, every single building in my district, and most specifically, I don't know why, the ones in the South Bronx, East Harlem buildings have problems, but the ones in the South Bronx are so dirty that I wanna cry every time I go into those buildings. Um, on the inside of the buildings, you know, you can tell they haven't been properly cleaned and maintained for a long time to the point that again, and I've mentioned this before, you have humongous like spider webs on top of people's doors. Um, outside the garbage buildup is really just, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm speechless every time I'm there. I really literally want to cry when I'm there because it's that bad. Um, and that obviously is contributing to a humongous you know, a rat population problem that is beyond controllable at this point. Um, I was at Mitchell Houses right before the pandemic, and I'll tell you that there was a rat hanging out in front of the building on Alexander Avenue, just sitting on. He was just sitting on the front on the front of the the, the stoop. You know, the door was open, have eating 
an orange peel because there was garbage everywhere. I, I couldn't believe it. I actually have video of, you know, of these encounters. I have pictures if you'd like to see them. Um, I have been meeting with the staff uh, and we are trying to address this, but every single time that we meet, it's like we're coming up with a plan. We're thinking of a plan. We're gonna implement a plan. And I would love to know today, when can I expect to see relief for my buildings because the conditions that the residents that I represent are living under um, are really just beyond anything that is, you know, that can be explained away. And um, and I'm horrified for them. So I would love to know what the timeline is. Like, when are people going to go in there and start, you know, ensuring that the buildings are clean, not only on the inside but on the outside, and that we're holding these contractors to task, and you know, and ensuring that they're cleaning behind the scaffolding and behind the netting. Um, because a lot of that is contributing to the, the pest issues. Um, and then you have all of these scaffoldings. Rats are climbing into the scaffold and I'm getting reports of like rats literally going into people's windows. Um, mm -hmm. Horrible, that's horrible. And East Harlem at Taft Houses, and I know Beverly's here, you know, some time ago, you know, we had instances where we had raccoons climbing. You know, I don't know if raccoons are part of your pest management, you know, strategy, but they happen. They, we have them, right? We have them at some of our developments as well. Um, and the, all of the garbage attracts them, right? And then the scaffolding doesn't doesn't help. Um, so I know that there's a there's a lot here, but I am really just, you know, I'm hoping to create some sort of a partnership and to get some clarity um, on when exactly are we going to start to address these issues? Like, is there a timeline? Um, thank, thank you, you Ken, um, thank you, Councilmember. I'm going to turn to um, Al and, um, and 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 Josie, um, who both oversee both these areas. But it, the one thing I did want to start out with the common theme that you hear all the time, because we meet regularly with the tenant leaders and staff uh, locally in your districts, both in the Bronx and in East Harlem, is staff will tell us we're really trying, but we're shorthanded. And, 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 I, and I feel for them and they're right. Um, so as part of uh, the federal money that came in through COVID, um, we are going to be able to hire an additional 1,072 uh, workers, um, as many residents as possible uh, for uh, a six month stint um, to make sure that they concentrate on the grounds um, and um, and then our permanent NYCHA staff can then concentrate inside the buildings um, as well. Um, this, uh, we can give you a breakdown of, of that 1,072 of the number that would be signed to your district. Um, in fact, we'll get the committee, you know, where they're gonna be broken down uh, as well for each of the committee members. Um, but we believe that, you know, this will um, greatly, um, is much needed relief for the staff who's on on hand right now um and and, and will will certainly help um but in addition it's um a strategy is needed and the strategy is in place uh through the action plans that were recently approved by the monitor both um al and uh, josie can talk a little bit more about about those but uh i've you know i've seen all the pictures that you said and um, we um, you know, most most of the time in, in, in real time, um, and uh, but it's been going on for too long. You're 100 percent right, um, Al. If you can add uh, add more to that, um, and uh, and Josie as well. Time has expired. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Count, Council Member, for bringing that you know that issue to our attention. Uh, the concerns that you have are are shared by the pest waste pest and waste management departments. Uh, the uh, you know the the of uh, the the short answer. Uh, I know you have a lot of concerns. Are that you know one of the uh, which I mentioned in my testimony. One one of the uh, reasons for creating a scorecard cleanliness system. Uh, cleanliness rating system is so that we can measure both the interior and exterior conditions of our developments throughout the city. Okay, we, we have worked with the federal monitor in developing this. 
this is an objective rating system uh, that'll uh, give it on, it'll be on the scale of one through five, uh, you know, one being uh, dirty, five being the cleanest, uh, their composite scores for each of the areas. It'll be elevators, lobbies, walkways, waste yards, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I'm sorry, Alan, I don't want to interrupt you, but I that's okay. When, when does, when, when do you guys plan to implement this, uh, scorecard system and what is different about the scores, the score system? Because I'm assuming that now there's still a shared responsibility, right? People are expected to, to, uh, to perform. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's anyone that's like supervising now. Like, it doesn't seem like anybody's like going out there and saying, okay, like we have a problem at this specific development, like, right. This garbage has been building up for quite some time. So it's pretty evident that no one's gotten to it. And, you know, in a while, like if that's not happening now, how am I supposed to feel comfortable with the fact that we're implementing a scorecard system? Do we have enough staff to oversee that? Well, that's, thank you council member for that. Uh, the basically uh, why we, you know, having a scorecard system, uh, as you, you may have heard, I, I came from the Department of Sanitation, which, uh, you know, you're familiar with uh, scorecard for street cleanliness and sidewalk cleanliness, that it's now this is going to be, I would say, uh, an enhanced uh, scorecard, something that will actually get down to granular detail so we can focus not only what the problems are, but where in the developments themselves, the problems lie. And then we would use them as a way of determining what resources we have, what people, what equipment, you know, what we have at the property level. And then we have to determine if that is a sufficient amount of people. I get it. I get it. But again, this all sounds like a job that's going to take a, a, a few it, months to implement. It's we're rolling it out. We're actually rolling it. it. It's kind of in its infancy. We've been testing it at different locations. We've rated different developments and we've seen where, uh, you know, where we have uh, some issues and concerns. And we've also seen positive results. You know, we've seen uh, and this is a way, uh, I think, uh, by investing time in this. I know uh, I, j I just want to assure you by us investing our time in this that what we're establishing is something that is a, uh, not only short-term, but it's a long-term measure of your developments so that you will get a rating and we'll supply it to you when it's all, you know, at your, you know, full transparency. This is what your development was rated. And the goal is to rate it every month and not only a development, but in the individual areas that we're talking about. Um, and I, look, I understand I, uh, as far as immediate relief goes, I'm more than glad for my, myself and my staff to meet with you or members uh, of your staff at specific locations, uh, and we could dus discuss the issues uh, and, 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 you know, and come up with plans. I mean, we, we already have some preliminary plans, but I would definitely like to include you and your staff. And, you know, I, I really, I, I, I hear your frustration. I share it. And, and I, I, um, yeah, I assure you that you have my... Well, I will 100%. Say that, you know, we will be out there this entire summer making sure that, you know, we're, you know, like I'm, I, if we have to, if we have to start facilitating cleanup, you know, uh, events at the different nights, then that's what it'll be. But, you know, we're going to keep hammering away at this until there is relief because it's just really right. feasible at this point. And, um, it's been years and you, you know, like years, years, um, you know, I, I'm a very reasonable person. Like I can work with people. I understand when things are happening. I like, I'm you're not going to find a more reasonable person in the world. However, within limits, within limits, you know, when you keep, when you, when I keep coming to hearings and I keep hearing, well, we're about to implement this and we're doing, we're in the process of doing that. And then it's like, Jesus Christ, this is another year. It is another six months that you're telling me. And in the interim, people have to walk through, you know, they have to try to run through the rats in the front of the buildings. You know, they have to hope that one of them doesn't climb into their, you know, apartment window in the interim. Um, and I, I just, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, we don't even know. And I'm sorry, Madam Chair, thank you. You're always so generous um, with, you know, allowing me the time, uh, but, 
you know, in, in, when you are doing pace, um, uh, pest management at the developments, like the resident leaders are not even informed, like there's not even a communicate, there's not even communication with them that says, hey, you know what, um, you know, we, you know, let's have a conversation. We understand that this development, you know, has a severe, you know, uh, rat infestation issue. This is what we're doing. What you don't know, you know why? Because when the residents come to the resident leaders, the resident leaders have no information to give. And then the resident leaders come to the council member and the council member has no information to give because nobody's communicating with me, nobody's communicating with them. Um, that would be, you know, I, I would I would suggest that that be, you know, part of the strategy is, you know, uh, really improving the lines of communication, maybe posting the buildings when you're doing um, pest management that advise, you know, residents, hey, th these are the days when the exterminator is gonna be, you know, um, outside of the, uh, of the development so that at least people know and they see um because that, you know when people know they understand they may not like it but at least they have information tangible information um and just my final question really is around the uh, the city cleanup court jobs are those jobs uh, do you, are, are those the same jobs that uh, brian referenced or is this a, a different set of, of of employment opportunities and how many of those uh would be coming to NYCHA and where um, council member, yes, those those jobs are are, are the same. So out of the um, 10,000 jobs that the city will be creating, uh, 1,072 will be at NYCHA. And they start when, do you know? We are currently interviewing, but we hope to have this ramped up by the summer, you know, which is coming soon, you know, within the next few weeks. Um, okay. so. Is there a plan for what happens after? Because you said this is six months. It's six months. Yeah, I mean, it's largely dependent on federal funds and how far they can stretch. But this is, you know, uh, we'll we'll deal with it, you know, at the end of this. But um, it would be great if we can, you know, keep this going as long as possible. It's certainly needed. The one, the. I'm sorry, Brian. We just, I, just because it's, it's part of the conversation, it's part of this, the same question. What prevents Nature from hiring people in the first place? Don't you get, you know, isn't isn't there like a budget per development that you know? I'm assuming that if you have funding for six, seven caretakers, whatever that is, whatever that is, right? Right. And short, like what, what's preventing you from hiring up? Um, it, it, the question always comes back to the same. It's funding, 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 right? So when I first started at 19 years ago, we had 15,000 uh, workers. We're down to uh, south of 11,000. Um, and that just shows you the level of operating funds that we have been cut over the years. Um, and um, and you don't experience cuts like that without seeing the effects and the effects that you see in your district, the effects that you see in council member uh, Alika Samuel's district, um, you know, places where you have a large con concentration of public housing. Of course, those are the places where you feel it the most. Um, and so when I go to development staff, don't, they don't say to me, I wish I had more money. I wish I had more vacation time. They say, I wish I had more colleagues who could help me, you know, clean the buildings. And they're right. Um, it is something that as part of our transformation plan, we're looking to do a more localized style of, of management. Um, we're looking to uh, make sure that uh, managers too are equipped to make decisions at their developments. So it's not, you know, only folks at 90 Church and 250 Broadway who are making these decisions, who in some cases have never been to some of the developments where they're making the decisions. So um, well, I, we I agree with you. Myself. I, I, I would volunteer myself and I'm sure that uh, Chair Samuels would uh, would join me in helping create some sort of advisory group with NYCHA so that we can help you know, implement a lot of these uh, action items because I think that the turnaround is really what is bothersome here is the, you know, the constant reinventing and strategy after strategy that just take way too long to implement and then observe whether or not they're fun, you know, they're, they're, they work or they don't work. And um, so I'm, you know, I, listen, I'm, I'm happy to be helpful where I can. I will come back again, you know, to the next hearing and hopefully we have better news, um, but I appreciate the time. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala. And just a quick follow up: out of the one thousand seventy-two positions, does NYCHA already have that funding? In like, do you already have the funding? Yes, it's that it's a part of uh, seven seven million dollars in federal funds that came from the COVID relief. Um, so it is, 
it's in place. Yeah, for now. It's not something that if you don't use it by a particular time, like a certain time. It, so no, it no, easier. but no, it, it it won't go away. But uh, but uh, we plan to use it as fast as we can because we need the summer's the time when you see more garbage when you because more people are outside, they're more active. Um, and you know we need the relief here as fast as possible. So when the funding's in place, we just have to now get the you know the bodies you know into development so they can start you know working. Okay, and I see that we have been joined by Council Member Vanessa Gibson as well. And I want to remind um, the public and NYCHA residents that after the Q and A, we will return to the residents first. <laughs> Um, to speak again. Um, do you have a upcoming caretaker onboarding process like happening this week or next week at all? I don't know, um, but we can caretaker look into day, that. Because I've been hearing um, a few people told me just in passing that they're starting um, some like training class they have to go to 90 church either this weekend or this week. We do regularly hire caretakers. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of turnaround in caretaker position. Um, it is very very tough work, um, and so we regularly hire uh, caretakers. But um, I could see if there's something special and get back to you get back to you by before the end of the day. Okay, thanks. How many staffers does NYCHA have that work on pest and waste conditions? And how many of these staffers are at the local developments? Thank you. Council member, oh, go ahead. Dave. I got it. Go ahead. Dave. I got it. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, Madam Chair, for that question. Um, the, the total number is 4,619 staffers. Uh, there are 140 people uh, in the pest control department, uh, 25 in the uh, waste management department and 4,454 uh, caretakers. Okay, and the caretakers obviously are at the, the development level and in terms for the exterminators uh, that pest control has, uh, has 22 people and 87 people are allocated to the borough shops, you know, for the exterminators. Got it. What trainings, what training does NYCHA staff receive to address pests and waste conditions at NYCHA? How long is the training and how much does the training cost? Okay, like, uh, thank you for the question. Madam Chair, uh, I'm going to refer you to uh, Josephine Bartlett. Hi, um, thank you for that question. Um, all of our exterminators have done integrated pest management um, trainings. They, um, the full one was a full day, um, and this was year. This has been yearly. And we've been doing um, many trainings, like how to use the HEPA vacuum, um, caulking, kind of like specific IPM trainings that are a few hours. Um, those are done in shop by our technical advisor who has decades of um, pest control experience. So it's part of his salary. So no additional cost there. We are also, as part of integrated pest management, we're really putting emphasis on that like pest issues are not just a extermination problem. We're working with caretakers to let us know when there's infestations in their compactor rooms or if little holes need to be um, plugged. We're saying that the caretakers need to do that. If they can't, they need to report it to their supervisor. So we are doing um, new um, part of the four day training that um, caretakers do. There is an IPM um, component. We also have trained more than 700 um, people on um, IPM, um, which was through our partners at Stop Pest, which is a HUD funded um, program, which is free of cost.
And how many vendors does NYCHA have working on the pest and waste management plan? And how many of these vendors are employing NYCHA residents? And you can also Thank talk about the roles of the vendors within the plan. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for that question. Uh, I will, uh, I'll cover the, the waste side. Uh, the vendors that we have, uh, uh, as I discussed before, the private carters for bulk removal at the developments, uh, as well as there are vendors for compactor repairs. Uh, you know, and, and as you have seen by the age of the equipment, there are a lot of them. Uh, we also have a mattress recycling program uh, that is on the horizon. Oh, uh, what? what did you just say? A mattress recycling program. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. Okay. Uh, it, it, so, uh, and that will also be run by a vendor that actually has, will uh, be, uh, be employing NYCHA residents. That was for the mattress recycling program. And that's the one that I mentioned in my testimony that was 25 locations and we plan to expand it to a hundred or so down the road. And is that information on the, um, the, is that on online for the public to see for residents to be able to know what's happening? And is there will, an informational process or sessions with Reese or? Uh, I, I know that will be, uh, I can, uh, we do. Uh, can I, yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the That's question, okay. Madam Chair. And we do work with resident engagement. We have also to complete the question. Uh, we have uh, vendors for cardboard baler installations, interior compactor replacement, in large HAPA doors and other waste and recycling initiatives. Um, there are seven vendors so far. Uh, I understand they've hired 32 NYCHA residents in total. Um, we do publish the, uh, I believe some or most of these initiatives that I've listed on our energy sustainability page. Um, there is a GIS map that shows uh, some of the improvement work that's happening. Is there a vendor performance track to ensure the quality of services that they are rendering? Absolutely. <clears throat> yes. And is there a way for residents to be able to interact? And I'm all, I'm thinking along the lines of when you had the private vendors that were cleaning the buildings during the COVID-19 process, there was a way for the residents to be able to to um, file complaints or you know let you know how the vendors were operating, what they were doing, what they were not doing in their individual developments. So the um, question is, is there a yep. way for the residents to be able to file a complaint or, you know, know who the vendors are and what's happening with them? Yeah, so what worked really well with the vendors during COVID was um, we had a really open relationship with the compliance department. And I think it was the first time people uh, understood what the compliance department, you know, did and the value of it. Um, that exists for any uh, any vendor you know, of, of NYCHA. So if you um, had somebody, you know, come to your apartment who's a vendor who is supposed to do some work, you can go to either the compliance department or the, or the quality assurance department and say, the vendor came, um, they um, didn't do, do the work properly or they didn't treat me respectfully or, you know, they did half the work and never came back. All those complaints can go to the compliance department or the um, quality assurance department, and they they will then be charged to make sure that this follows through. And when I asked if there was a, 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 a tracking system for the quality of services, just I know you said yes, but I mean, I, you know, it was no, a lot of <laughs> how, like how is it tracked? How is the performance tracked? The performance is tracked. Our uh, project managers uh, evaluate the work and they uh, uh, use our e-builder system to uh, make sure that all the work is completed on time and on schedule. And uh, we have field inspection staff that goes out and checks on the work that's happening. 
Okay. And I know we've been talking a lot about the compactors and the life cycles, but now I'm just going to ask specific questions about the life cycle of, of the compactors. According to the pest and waste management plan, NYCHA conducted a 2018 infrastructure assessment of 274 developments. 255 had interior compactors and 108 had exterior compactors are at the end. 255 had interior compactors and 108 had exterior compactors at the end of their useful, at the end or past their youthful life. How old is NYCHA's oldest compactor? And what is the performance of this compactor? Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. I'll take it. Um, the performance is completely dependent on the use and the maintenance. We actually have two compactors that are 28 and a half years old and functioning well. Um, they're located at the Bedford-Stuyvesant Rehab and Lower East Side uh, 2. Um, so we wouldn't look to replace these compactors if they're maintained and functioning well. Uh, we have another exterior compactor that is over 25 years old, and it's located at Carl Carlton Manor. What is the average age of an interior compactor and the average age of an exterior compactor? Thank you for that question. The average age of an interior compactor is approximately 18 years. And an average age of an exterior compactor is approximately 14 years. What is the useful life of an interior compactor and the useful life of an exterior compactor? The manufacturer recommended useful life for an exterior interior compactor, uh, interior compactor is 10 to 15 years. And uh, the manufacturer's recommended useful life for an exterior compactor is seven to 10 years. So um, can you explain, so just looking at those, the, just the useful life, question and then going back to the oldest compactor and the performance of that compactor can you explain that number of 30 years and 25 years compared to what is um, suggested for the useful life and in the, and then hearing that number 10 to 15 years yeah, um, the manufacturer generally projects that a compactor will fail within, within those timeframes. Um, but apparently in those particular developments, the staff have been taking care of those compactors and they've lasted much longer than the useful life. Uh, it does happen. Uh, but uh, in across the portfolio, as you've heard in Mr. Ferguson's testimony, 80% of our equipment at, is at the end of its useful life and may not be functioning properly. Has NYCHA found that buildings with the upgraded compacted infrastructure showing a reduction in pest related complaints? Thank you for that question, Chair. I'll pass it on to Mr. Ferguson to answer this question. Thank you for your question, Madam Chair. Um, I, I I don't know. I don't. You know, we don't track it that way. We don't track that information. Uh, but uh, that that's. I think that's a great idea. You know that. You know, going forward, uh, that that's definitely something that we should be looking into. Okay. All right. So, okay. According to, Hi. so I didn't want to go into details, like dive into that, but I just, I, you said you don't, you don't track that. So the question was how has NYCHA found that buildings with upgraded compacted infrastructure do they show a reduction 
and pest related complaints. So if we're talking about compactors, right? And the, right. the how, how old the compactors are and, um, you know, and I, and I understand the development being able to, you know, right. maintain that particular compactor. But if you have upgrades to it, you know, we're trying to see the, the, the clearly the correlational linkage between the, the, the age of the compactor and pest complaints. So I would think that there would be some kind of tracking of that. I, uh... I, I agree. I agree. It's logical. You know, it's a logical that there's, there's okay. a definitely would be a tracking. No, I, I just, I, <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to establish, uh, all of the, the metrics, uh, mm -hmm. for example, in preparation for this, uh, for this hearing that, uh, I was able to, uh, get the you know the number of interior compactors are 2975 uh exterior compactors you have 316 um and then you know also uh you know piece of uh, trivia information is that in williamsburg they have the largest number of interior compactors uh they have 136 of them you know for the interior compactors uh, and then on, as far as exterior compactors, Drogsnick has six. They, that is the largest number of exterior compactors that we have. Uh, and uh, to, to clearly answer your question, I'm sorry, I just, uh, to uh, go, you know, one step further, I just, you know, I was looking to answer your question and, and I, now I can embellish or, or, or go a little bit further, uh, but it, it, it's definitely a valid, concern uh that uh i'm not sure if you're aware of or, or the numbers or i may have mentioned uh that about half of nitro locations nitro developments are curb have curbside collection and uh the balance have uh exterior compactors so uh you know there there should also be a relationship of you know, the, a seal having a sealed compactor, okay, and that's part of the HUD agreement assertion, is that the material either has to be in a sealed compactor or picked up once every twenty four hours. Council Member, I, I think the the, the the to going back to the question you asked, I think the the data match um, looking at um, developments that have had upgraded upgrades in the infrastructure and uh, pest complaints. Could be done very quickly. It's something that we could we can do and, and share with you. It would be really an interesting exercise and uh, a different way of looking at things too. It also would certainly help us when we make the case for investment um, to go to council members such as yourself and say, when you invest in compactors, you see X results. So. Um, exactly. that, I, I think exactly. that's, I think, that, I think that's helpful. Um, uh, so we can come back to you with that shortly. Okay. Okay. And I'm just thinking, you know, like as you, yeah, as you're strategizing and, and putting your plans in place, that would just be, it would just be helpful. Um, and I know that council member Riley had, um, you know, spoke to and had questions around the, the collection of trash and you was just speaking on that. Um, how, so according to the pest and waste management plan, NYCHA at sanitation on, November 2019 to increase the curbside collection to seven days a week. But sanitation was unwilling to provide these services because of costs. And so would this increase in curbside collection lead to an increase in head count at NYCHA and or sanitation? And what is the associated personnel, well, the um, OTPS cost and personal services costs? Um, if there was this increase in the collection to seven days. And if you can just go back over what service does sanitation currently provide to NYCHA? Okay, uh, I'll start off with the sanitation currently provides uh, for uh, the curbside locations, right? We, we have the, the curbside, the bucket, we have curbside, and then we have containerized. Uh, the curbside locations get anywhere from two to four times service a week. Uh, it's 
majority of them are either two or three times. Most of our developments, I will tell you, are getting three times service. And that means they're getting service either on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Okay, at the curbside locations. Now, at the containerized locations, they get as much service as they need. That uh, if they have, uh, we have certain containers that are serviced every other day that get, you know, multiple service. So some people, some containers actually even get service four times a week or five times a week. So as needed, uh, we have two types of service when it comes to, comes to containerization. There's scheduled service and there's call-in service. There's either because the, the high generation rates that we have at our locations that they'll pick up on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesdays and Fridays, they'll pick up all the compactors. Uh, so that's a scheduled or a call-in could be at certain locations that do not generate as much that they wait for the, uh, the compactors to be filled. There's a red light that goes on on the power unit that powers up the compactor. And when that light goes on, it says it's at 80% capacity and you basically have another day or two of room left in that compactor. So they call it in. That's called call-in service. Does that make sense? That I okay. Yeah. So we have scheduled service, call-in service, and then curbside service. Um, uh, as far as you know, sanitation uh, providing you know the additional service, it would be to the curbside locations because I believe that the containerized locations uh, need upgraded need upgraded containers. And most locations, you know, obviously based on the useful life and, and the current age of the containers, uh, that we definitely uh, we definitely need to, uh, you know, keep improving, which we have it in the plan to get our new uh, compactors. So we're going to go back to the curbside location, uh, which we generally get either two or three times service and recycling is picked up once a week at those locations as well. So, so the more requested the seven days a week for the curbside collection yes. um, and, uh, and sanitations, you know, was not able to do that. Have you come up with what that would cost at all? And, and um, have conversations with the administration on increasing funding to be able to do seven days a week curbside collection? Uh, no, no, I did not. Uh, the Department of Sanitation, uh, I'm just going to tell you from my experience about the challenges that, you know, there, it, it, you know, how they develop the cost plan uh, will be, uh, you know, whether or not the trucks could go uh, cross uh, district boundaries, you know, the sanitation districts are coterminous with the community boards. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there, there'll be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, various options uh, that uh, and, and factors that would be considered in their cost. Uh, but the the lion's share of the cost would be on the New York City Department of Sanitation side. I do not know what that cost is. Uh, but uh, the other the other component is us, which I did not. Uh, I honestly did not. Uh, you know, I didn't calculate how much more effort. Uh, however, uh, what, where, uh, I, I, I want to put out there, I had mentioned in my testimony, testimony that we purchased two compacted trucks. I was just about to say that Okay. <laughs> in your testimony, you mentioned, mm -hmm. continue. so there are two six yard, uh, compacting trucks. So, um, each, you know, a six yard, uh, the department, so you get a sense department of sanitation has a 25 yard. Uh, compacted truck. All right. So that's the amount of, it's a volume, the amount of material that it holds. Each sanitation truck holds, can hold between uh, 10 and 15 tons on average. Okay. So we bought two six yard trucks. The thought behind buying these trucks were so that they could be at our developments and that they can navigate the development safely. Because, as you know, the bohemians that the sanitation has, the 25 yarders, are huge. They have the double wheels in the back. And, you know, I, I think there's a certain, you know, for uh, the type, the additional collection. I mean, there is curbside collection, which there's, there's, there's no concern. But if we were to pick up garbage within the developments, 
you know, to make it easier. And, and it goes to your point. Uh, part of my thought process was if we were to go with additional service, how would we do it? Will we just put the material at the curb or would we uh, navigate, you know, the interior roads, you know, depending on the size of the developments? So there's a lot of factors that have to be considered as well. Uh, but uh, just even getting back to the request, uh, sanitation's, uh, uh, you know, a, a initial response was to, uh, for us to, you know, uh, start by, you know, recycling more, you know, and instead of just putting everything by the curb, uh, you know, because NYCHA had a history of, of not recycling as much as they could have. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're definitely looking to, uh, you know, change that around. Uh, so uh, again, getting back to the, the additional service, if we, if we run into any problems, if we need additional service, sanitation has been more than accommodating, more than responsive uh, and getting us anything that we need, uh, you know, in terms of additional service. And, uh, and, and, and my feeling is also that as we go location to location, developing our individual waste management plans, uh, and, and just to give you another uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to. I, I don't. I don't want to take up your time. Or, or just. I just want to give you a better explanation. That uh, the action plans are living, breathing documents. That it's a plan, and it's only as good as to the, up to that day that it's made. And we're trying to always make it better. You know, look at it, change it, make it better. Um, you know, it's something that. Uh, must be constantly revised based on uh, the needs and the changing needs. Uh, for example, I'll give you a, a quick, for example, Baruch houses. It has a tremendous amount of Sandy work being performed right now. Uh, so there is tremendous amount of construction, fences, gates, uh, you know, the, the local law 11, like, you know, we've mentioned the local law 11 uh, sh sidewalk shedding, uh, all of that, all of those things change the way we do business, right? To change how we have to, it's making it more challenging to clean the development. You know, what we have to revise plans, we have to revise janitorial plans, we have to revise grounds plans. Uh, so uh, does that make sense? I mean, am I, I just, I want to make sure that it's, I'm not. It's, no, I get it. I get it. I get it. We see a lot of um, changes and in, in development changes. And when I say development, I'm talking about development, construction, um, cleanup initiatives. There's, there's a lot going on in New York City right now. And so um, I, I get what you're saying. I just have a, a quick question to another follow up. What was the cost of the two trucks? Uh, they were $136,000 each. Okay. All right. And um. And I'm just going to, you mentioned recycling in that, and I want to get some of those recycling questions um, sure. on the record as well. On March 3rd of 2020, NYCHA issued an RFQ to re-envision its waste yards, which pose significant health risks to residents as they are in close proximity to play areas, apartments, and other public space, spaces. Um, can you identify for the committee the seven developments subject to the NYCHA design bill RFQs for improvement to the exterior yards? Um, and also by what criteria were these developments chosen? And what's the status of the RFQs for each development? Um, and is the construction still on schedule uh, to be completed by December, 2022? Um, you know, with so many changes happening with COVID and if any of the projects, you know, like have broken ground at all. So just the status. Okay. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm going to refer you to Vlada Kenneth that she has, that's, that's one of her projects and I'm sure she has more information on that. Thank you, Al. Um, the seven developments are Jackson, Marcy, Morris Two, Webster, East 180th Street, St. Monterey Avenue, LaGuardia, th uh, three, 303 Vernon Avenue. Um, the we are in RFP stage. We just released the RFP um, for the short shortlisted teams. 
Um, we are on schedule with uh, these uh, waste yards. We are very excited about these waste yards. We do think that they will be um, re-envisioning how we do waste management at our developments. Uh, they are uh, no longer replacement in kind. They're looking to do new equipment and recycling storage as a part of the uh, waste yards. Um, also noise reduction elements are a part of the new design. We are also considering visual screening material for cleanliness and security. And we're focused on the aesthetics and uh, ability to customize each site. Um, so we're very much looking forward to uh, working with the residents in particular on the designs and placement of the recycling infrastructure as a part of these uh, new waste yards. The first one uh, is Marcy, where we are uh, working very closely with residents. The residents have weighed in on the placements of the tested locations. We've done surveys um, through resident engagement. We've done webinars and we are gonna be working with the design teams that are selected um, to be able to weigh in on uh, additional way stations. Um, does NYCHA have recycling centers at all developments? NYCHA does have recycling centers at all developments. Uh, this was rolled out as a part of the 2015, 2016 uh, coordination with, in coordination with the Department of Sanitation. At the same time, uh, NYCHA and DSNY developed signage and education, training materials for both residents and staff. And can you just quickly explain, some of the recycling centers are indoors and some are outdoors. So can you explain like which one's the outdoor, which one an indoor, um, if that's possible, like what's the difference? The the all the recycling infrastructure that I am aware of, uh, particularly the glass, metal, plastic, paper, cardboard recycling, is outdoors. Um, there, um, there may be in some places e-waste yeah. recycling and textile recycling that is mm -hmm. indoors, but all of the glass, metal, plastic, paper, cardboard uh, recycling infrastructure is currently outdoors. And with the ones that are outdoors, are the recycling centers placed in one location per development or, or are they in multiple locations? There are, there's at least um, two bins per building. If it's a single building, if it's more than three buildings, um, that would get uh, two, two bins, uh, the, the green and the, and the blue. And so uh, the, there is a centralized infrastructure in uh, both single buildings and uh, campus style buildings. And what about senior only buildings? Where are they located within senior only buildings? They're usually right outside of the building. Those are generally single, uh, uh, single buildings. And so those are generally right outside of the uh, buildings. Is NYCHA tracking diversion rates at developments that now have recycling centers? Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. Al, would you like to take this question? Uh, we, we currently do not track uh, recycling at these locations. Uh, the, uh, the amount of anything that's collected in the recyclable containers uh, are placed in the recycling areas and they're picked up once a week at the developments. And that material is commingled with the, uh, the household recyclables of the, uh, the truck that services the entire neighborhood. So there is no way for us to determine, uh, you know, come up with a weight, which would give you your diversion rate. Um. Do you have any plans at all to set any goals related to how you'll be able to collect this information if you feel is necessary and um, like even working with the residents on um, expanding resident uh, recycling yeah. participation? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, that uh, recycling is, is a high priority uh, for the authority. And um, the recycling, which would, I'm trying to break down currently, uh, how we can determine uh, which material you know, we're picking up, where we can grab the numbers 
uh, for to come up with a diversion rate. You know, we could do diversion rate either by weight or by volume, because as you know, landfill, it doesn't know weight, it knows volume, it's space. So uh, basically, we want to take all of the initiatives, the mattresses, uh, the cardboard bales, we have these, the new cardboard bales, which I mentioned in my testimony, uh, that we're able to make, uh, you know, it's, it's much simpler. It's basically, you just lift open the top, throw your cardboard boxes in there at the development, and then they actually have a bailing machine that it actually gets, you know, when it reaches the weight limit, that it has the bailing machine. And that particular piece of equipment reports back that actually has new technology that has its cellular technology that reports back and it lets you know how many bales were made. And we already know what we set it, you know, for a weight so that sanitation could pick it up uh, without straining themselves. It'll be 40, 50 pounds. You could set it to like hundred pounds if you wanted to, but sanitation said 40 pounds is, is the weight that they're okay with. So we know how many bales are created uh, and it's only at select locations, but it's a start. My goal is to have uh, E equipment or I equipment, you know, however, however you want to say very intelligent equipment that can report back to us when people are using things. And part of the bailing machine uh, and, uh, you know, not to bore you to death with this, the, the, the little details, uh, but uh, with the bailing machine, you can actually see when people are using the bailer it knows when the bailing machine is actually working. So it helps us to make sure that if we want to know if somebody's recycling, it'll report back to us saying they use this machine every day. And then another, then another, you know, another development may report back that nobody's used this machine in two days or three days. And then that these are all flags that come up and these are great, great management tools uh, and it's ways of accountability. Uh, and it's a way of also determining uh, and developing our new diversion rate. Reci uh, the mattresses, that'll be something else because mattress is an, another uh, big volume item that we can figure out how much landfill space, you know, part of the diversion rate, right? Diversion rate is the amount of material that we're diverting away from landfills. So we'll be able to tell with the mattresses. Uh, we recycle also uh, stoves and refrigerators. Uh, you know, we have, we're, we're getting numbers on that now, uh, as well as sanitation does pick up some of them. Uh, so, you know, I want to come up with uh, good estimates on our own front, mm -hmm. as well as working with our sanitation partner and providing a uh, reliable diversion rate. I hope I've answered your question. You have, you have, mm -hmm. you have, you answered that question and you answered the, you know, a, a series of other questions that I have related to clarification around the mattress. <laughs> so okay. thank you for that. Um, I only have a few more questions um, that I need to just get on the record. The neighborhood rat reduction program began in 2017 with the goal to reduce the rat population by 70% at 110 sites. Has the program met or come close to the goals that were set? How much does the neighborhood rate reduction program cost? And um, has NYCHA successfully installed the 50 rat slabs across nine developments as stated in the plan? And if not, what were the causes for the delay? So can you just speak to the rat reduction program? Thank you, Madam Chair, for that question. I'm gonna defer the, uh, the pest part of that question to Josephine Bartlett. I, um, we are close. Um, we month to month, we are about at 65%. Last month, we had a 67% um, reduction. This month right now, we're at 61%. So we are getting close to our 70%. Um, this is um, the cost of it is our 22 exterminators that work on this um, borough collapsers, which is eight people, our um, uh, 72 seasonals, eight caretakers, three SOEs, one program manager. Um, it is 
51 full-time staff for NRR. This is $2,288,954. Um, and the seasonal budget to date is $322,000. Um, for the rat slabs, I'll pass it to Vlada. Thank you. Um, I understand that 14 slabs have been completed. Uh, there are 36 that are in progress. Uh, COVID has had an impact on delays in this particular project. There was a uh, citywide funding freeze for eight months. The, this program is capitally funded, um, city funded. Also, um, rat slabs are uh, done in confined spaces. So some of that work couldn't be performed during COVID restrictions. So can you just briefly give us a um, like a quick understanding or just put it into context, the, the complaints that you've heard around um, the rats recently, right? And the rat reduction program. Can you explain um, why we still hear um, rat complaints? Um, and you know, just to kind of explain for the public why in mm -hmm. one hand, you know, we can talk about this, you know, this amazing program, but on the other hand, you know, folks still struggling with rats. Absolutely. Um, Unfortunately, we can't get rid of the rats completely. So we are still seeing these complaints. Um, we have made um, a lot of headway, like council member Ayala was speaking about um, places in Harlem, like Jefferson in her district had 152 rat burrows when they entered the program in 2019. And last month we're at 70. Johnson has also seen a very um, big decrease from 131 from their baseline to 44. Kings Tower 184. And last month we're down to 18. So as she said, but also as she said, she said South Bronx is having um, a lot of difficulties. And yes, we're having a lot of challenges. Um, Patterson, which is in the neighborhood rat reduction, um, is at the same level as when it came in. It does fluctuate, obviously, every month is different, and we work with our Department of Health um, partners. They have an inspection team that does these borough counts, but Patterson was at 82 rat burrows, and last month they were at 83. Our team has been working really diligently on the gardens. There's a few gardens that were created with partnership with the MAP program, and we've been working with those gardeners to really um, target areas where we're seeing a lot of rat burrows um, in these spaces. So our team is there treating the grounds twice a week and is working on that closely. Mitchell, although it's not a neighborhood rat reduction program, we know it has issues and we have um, a team of exterminators there twice a week treating the grounds and um, working um, in the basements as well. So um, yes, uh, we, you know, there's ups and downs when each um, development has its challenges, um, but that's part of the integrated pest management to kind of see where the root cause again is, where we can target and get better results in the future. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so now I'm just gonna ask a question, a couple of questions about the um, pre-considered intros, the bills themselves, related to the New York City Housing Authority complaints. When NYCHA responds to a resident complaint about pests and does some kind of fix, is it NYCHA's policy to ask the resident whether the pest condition has been addressed before marking the complaint resolved? And does NYCHA have any particular policy involving senior households or households with children? Thank you, Madam Chair, for that question. Uh, I'm gonna refer you to Josie Bartlett again. So um, part of our new standard procedure when we go into an apartment, if there is a pest infestation, um, 
on the work order, we put corrective action taken and they must mark the level of infestation that they saw, low, medium, high. This is all standardized and has been taught to our exterminators. This triggers a follow-up work order automatically, which we has a priority, like what we spoke about with the matrix earlier and our exterminator goes back again on this new work order. Um, if they see uh, signs of pest again, they would do corrective action taken again and another follow-up was created until really the issue is resolved um, wait, and they can put- Real yeah. quick, you said the first time, so they make a complaint and then someone comes out and you said corrective action was taken and there's a follow-up. I don't really understand that. How do you have okay. corrective, action, corrective action taken if it wasn't um, resolved? So the a treatment is done on that visit. So they put down pesticides, they do HEPA, they do uh, you know, HEPA vacuum, um, they caulk, they seal, you know, it's different for each work order and we track it, we see what is done, but they don't know if that has eliminated the issue until they come back. So if corrective action is marked, so this is a little nitty gritty, but on each work order, there's four options you can do. There's preventative, you don't see pests, but um, we put, we did some caulking, we did some gel to be preventative in, in case in the future. Um, satisfactory means no pests. We don't use pesticides and um, there's not a follow-up. But when corrective action is marked on this work order, the infestation level has to be marked and automatically a follow-up work order is done. And that's just to make sure to see that when they come back again, what is the level of infestation again? Is it still medium? Is it low? Has it been gone away? Like this is the way that we know if what we've done um, has eradicated the issue. So whose job is it with, within NYCHA to, to make sure that if a case or complaint is marked resolved, that is actually resolved? Who so we have on the pest side, we've got a few levels of um, Q&A going on. Um, we all of our five teams of exterminators have one to two supervisors of exterminators, which are always doing pop ups on their staff. They put their labor code on the work orders and we can see from um, a management side which apartments they've done and what has been done. Um, we also have environmental health and safety, which does um, reviews of the work orders and um, does reviews in person to see what it is being done and that it matches up with what we're seeing on the work order. We have a QA department that is doing the same and then the pest control department that I am part of. We are looking at these work orders and we have two technical advisors who have decades of experience that go out shadow staff and make sure that um, when they're doing integrated pest management, they're doing it to our standards and that the work is being done with what we want. So because, you know, the, comp, the conversation lately is always around accountability and transparency and making sure that agencies are working together you know, um, if there's a rat infestation, or, you know, how is that being tracked with DOH image? And when we're talking about waste management, you know, what, you know, how are you working with sanitation? Um, can you speak to this bill around um, being able to call in complaints with 311? Um, do you think it's possible to merge the NYCHA call center with 311? You know, can you just give us your thoughts around the bill itself? Come to remember. Um, so, as you know, this is an idea that's been around for a long time, um, and at different times, NYCHA, you know, has, you know, entertained it and had conversations with with do it. Um, the and you've been to our call center in Long Island City, and it's actually a very it's a very good call center. It really is. I think I I, I kind of wish that. Um, that uh, you know more residents and, and and more council members could go there because uh, if you see it, it runs really well. I think people get frustrated uh, because 
Um, they call the call center, they get a work order number. And yes, it's true. Sometimes the work doesn't get done the way in, in the time that it was supposed to. The quality of work is not what they wanted. And they, and they think it automatically it's the call center that was the problem. The call, when in fact, oftentimes the call center did its job. You know, the, you, you call there, you, you put in your complaint, they gave you the ticket number. The problem I think a lot of times is, and something we recognize, the problem is, you know, oftentimes with the um, making sure that the work gets done and making sure that this quality is getting done, but it's not the call center. Um, NYCHA residents um, can you call 311 uh, currently, and those complaints do get routed to NYCHA, you know, and would anyway, you, you know, would, would, would no matter what. Um, just like any other landlord, though, if you lived, I always compare it to Stytown because it's a big apartment complex or Starrett City or something like that. Your first line of defense would be call the landlord, you know, uh, in, the, in that instance. If the landlord does not do what they're supposed to do, then you can call 311 and, 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 uh, and they would um, be able to route it to the proper agency. Um, we believe that we need to get better in terms of quality assurances with work order tickets. I'm not, I, I know that this bill is well-intentioned, but I'm not sure it achieves that goal. Okay. And um, just, I mean, it's, this is a resolution, but it's a state bill, but you know, what do you think your thoughts around the Utility Accountability Act? Yes, so I, I, I've, I've had several conversations with the uh, with Assemblyman Branson about this bill. We, when we've looked at it very closely, it would cost us about $35 million um, um, uh, in expense dollars um, if we were uh, to enact the bill um, as, you know, as written. Um, we, um, I, I think the goal here is to make sure that we have fewer um, outages and make sure that they last a shorter, shorter period of time. I'm not sure how taking resources away from us does it achieves that goal. Nationally, we're having a conversation around infrastructure, and I think we all agree that the way to get better services is to invest in our infrastructure, not to be punitive on a municipality or an agency. And I think, you know, in some ways, while very long outages, especially around gas, are more than frustrating. I, I, I don't even have the word, you know, in my vocabulary to describe what they are, um, are, you know, just unacceptable. Um, I don't, you know, costing, a, you know, um, I, I, I'm not sure if this is the right way to go. Um, the, the other thing the, the bill does needs to be tightened up, and I, and I told the sponsor this too, and we, we'd be happy to work with him on. It does not differentiate between the cause of the outage, right? So it could be NYCHA, it could be, for instance, I remember a few years ago, we were out at Howard Houses, Con Ed, you know, just shut down elevator service for everybody. Well, the way the bill is written right now, NYCHA then would have to pay residents, you know, for that shutdown in service um, as well. Um, and Councilmember Machaka, I know who you know is you know pushing this resolution, um, understandably because in Red Hook we've experienced a lot of gas outages. Red Hook House is 82 years old, and the infrastructure is the same age. And if you if if you know anyone who's 82 who really didn't take very good care of themselves, they're probably not in good shape. And Red Hook Houses um, is also experiencing about. $500 million in upgrades around Sandy. So as we dig, you know, um, contractors sometimes are, you know, you know, hitting things that they're not supposed to, but, you know, it does cause outages. Um, and, but it's also, there are pipes that are well past their shelf life. Um, we've had conversations with the council member. We've had conversations with Red Hook Initiative, other groups in that area and say, really the best way to go is to look to replace the gas risers rather than, you know, and then, you know, long-term we probably wouldn't have, you know, that issue. And, uh, and I, I, think, I think through investment, we can, we, we, we'd, be, we'd be better suited to achieve the goal here. Okay, thank you so much for that, Brian. Um, I actually do not have any other questions. Um, 
but I do hope that just hearing your testimony today, we're able to, uh, you know, really work together on pest and waste management. Um, there's been some real takeaways, and I know Councilmember Ayala mentioned it, um, you know, for even our offices coming together, um, clearly there's some need for some roundtables and working directly with the residents related to communication, um, information um, sharing, um, everything else. So um, there's definitely a need for some follow up, but I do appreciate um, the conversation. So again, they, I have no more questions for um, NYCHA, but I do know that we have a couple of residents who wanted to um, speak after the Q&A with the authority. So I'll turn it back over to- and, and, and Council Member, can I just add, can I just add something that came up earlier? Earlier you had asked about, you know, what's going on at 90 Church around hiring. Um, that is around the cleanup core. Um, and to date, um, we have hired um, over um, 500, uh, 500 people for that, uh, for those positions, and over half of them have been residents. So, uh, and they started, uh, some of them started the last week of May. So we're halfway to our goal. We hope uh, by July to be fully there uh, to the 1,000 hired. And uh, the current numbers are 539 hired, 224 of them are residents. Say one more time the number. 539 hired to date, uh, 224 residents. Okay, okay. And is there, and there is a, a heavy push to inform the residents about this job opportunity. We sent this all to, you know, all, re you know, all residents with email addresses. We've been, you know, putting it out there on social and made sure that all the tenant leaders to do have it. And, you know, any council members, if you uh, want to make sure that the residents in your district know about it, you know, please encourage them to apply. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Audrey? Thanks very much. We will now return to testimony from members of the public. Uh, please listen for your name. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute. The Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be set to two minutes. Um, I would now like to welcome caller one to testify. For the record, could you please state your name? Caller one. Your time will begin. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Ambry Samuel and committee council members for having me here today. My name is Diana Blackwell, and today I'm speaking as a member of the NYCHA Recycling Committee for the Manhattan South Solid Waste Advisory Board, or the MSWAP, a voluntary citizen advisory board dedicated to helping NYC achieve a zero waste goal. As advocates for consistent, equitable access to sustainability and on sanitary waste management systems, the NYCHA Recycling Committee and I are eagerly following the development of the Pest and Waste Management Action Plan. Today, as the committee discusses oversight of waste management issues and pest problems, we want to remind the council that sustainability and community can, can and should be embedded in the work laid out by this plan. The purpose of the Pest and Waste Management Action Plan is to provide decent safe and sanitary housing for NYCHA residents by the way of litter and pest-free campuses. The members of the NYCHA's newly formed waste management department have begun a reinvigorated campus waste management, primarily by way of individual waste management plans for each campus, waste access inventory, and infrastructure upgrades. The NYCHA Recycling Committee applauds these plans as foundational structures for the provisions of sanitary waste collection and removal. Proper infrastructure is the basis for any sound waste management program. We are aware that NYCHA is developing recycling programs for institutional waste, such as back of house cardboard and mattresses. However, a more vigorous effort is needed in order to contribute to the city's reduction goals for waste and greenhouse gas emissions. 
According to the NYCHA 2018 Waste Management Re- Report, they now have a diversion rate of an increase of 2%. This means a staggering 1,900, I'm sorry, 196,000 tons of NYCHA waste is sent to landfill or incinerated. This is equivalent to 50,000 tons of gas uh, GHS emissions every year. 75% of these totals could be reduced with a robust recycling plan. To further increase NYCHA recycling rates, NYCHA must make additional plans for sustainability, increasing residential participation in recycling. These plans should be implemented and alongside the infrastructural and institutional improvements. As NYCHA works hard to revitalize waste yards and build recycling infrastructures into new campus waste systems, they must also work with the residents to build in recycling programs. Just like every other New Yorker, NYCHA residents should know how in their building, their recycling bins will be reliable to be located, and they should know which materials go in each bin. Achieve an excellent residential Time participation. Time has expired. Thank you. We do applaud NYCHA. Thank you. Ms. Blackwell, please continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to repeat. Achieve an excellent resident participation takes resident involvement, ongoing education, and hands-on contamination control. The Bureau should coordinate with these environmental leaders to ensure effective recycling education at each campus and discover which campuses might benefit from the installation of the DSNY program, such as e-waste and textile recycling that are currently available to NYCHA campuses. Now, we do apply NYCHA for creating a comprehensive plan for the institutional waste management. As rapid improvements continue to occur in NYCHA's waste infrastructure and collection, we ask that you extend these improvements to NYCHA's sustainability and community involvement so that we create campuses that are not only cleaner, but greener and safer and more empowered. And I thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. I believe this concludes public testimony. However, if we have inadvertently forgotten to call on anyone to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we will try to hear from you. Seeing no hands, I will turn it back over to Chair Ambry Samuel to close the hearing. Thank you so much. I do want to recognize um, the committee staff. Thank you so much, Audrey, for your assistance during this um, hearing and for all the prep leading to it, as well as Ricky Chala and Jose Condi. Um, I also want to um, just personally thank Ms. McFarland, uh, Ms. Blackwell, and Ms. Mansick for coming in and testifying today. I always appreciate your voice um, and your expertise. Um, and I would like to do that follow up, uh, Ms. McFarland, with um, Diana Ayala, Councilmember Ayala, and Ms. Blackwell, I will also like to follow up with you because you mentioned some things around um, just, just gas and um, sustainability. And I do have a gas um, ban bill um, that has been introduced in the council and I would love to be able to get your, um, your input. Um, thank you so much, NYCHA, for your testimony today. And I do look forward to the um, follow-up. So you will receive um, you know, clearly a follow-up from the committee, and I look forward to those next steps. So with that, um, that will conclude today's um, hearing with the Public Housing Committee, um, and enjoy a safe and um, prosperous uh, 